as an executive director, is it appropriate for me to sit in on meetings with the nominating committee for potential new board members? What if it's someone I solicited and recommended? So absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Heck yes. <laughs> like, I would be worried if you weren't a part of that. Yeah, why, I'm, I'm curious why you would think the other why why you would think it was inappropriate like what are you avoiding right and i'm wondering if you're feeling like there's some sort of conflict of interest because you solicited somebody but at the end of the day that's part of your shared role with the board mm-hmm. is to identify and help recruit new board members yes. so so yes yeah, so i think it's a fairly straightforward answer is absolutely appropriate and um and at the end of the day even if you aren't the one who solicited but i i would want you Make sure you are in the room for all those discussions, because here's the thing. You may have insight or knowledge about that potential board member that your other board members don't. Um, And also, if you can't work with them. So and that's important to be able to share in a safe environment. So there's a group I've done some work with that basically has a whole process around this, but basically gave their their CEO and said, listen, if here's the thing, we're going to do our process. And at some point at this stage, we're going to, at the beginning, we're going to kind of say the name of who we're going after to recruit. And if this is someone you absolutely, for whatever reason, and you don't have to necessarily disclose it, but that you were like, no, like, like you, you actually get that. We're going to give you that power and authority because you are the head of this organization. We will give you that authority to say absolutely not and and that's extreme but i guess i'm trying to just draw the point home that it's it's okay like you need to be a part of this yeah so when you're so where do the where do the roles begin and end with a nominating committee because i've seen it go a a whole bunch of different ways i've seen organizations where there's there's a very formal process right there's the you've got the the form and like everybody's sort of categorized into whatever like specialization or industry or whatever. Um, And then, so you're looking for somebody in a very specific band. And, and then I've seen other organizations who just like, Oh, we need another board member and they need to be, you know, human. (laughs) So (laughs) does anybody know anybody? So like what, where's, I mean, what do you think the best, the best way to go about selecting board members is assuming that we're answering this question with like, uh uh-huh. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like you have to be involved. So I am huge in recruitment and no matter the size of the organization, because I think it is what can really make or break an organization. So with that, I'm, I err on the side of more is better. So I think it's whomever, whether it's, it's someone on the committee, it's another board member, it's yourself as the executive director, you find someone that you think is a potential fit. And the first thing you do is, throw out the name to see what intel everyone else in that group process has. So I think that's kind of the first step. And then hopefully looking at it strategically saying, why this person, right? Do we have these other skill sets on our board? So I think then it goes down the process of we're filling, we only have so many board seats. We need to make sure each is filled in a way that's going to help this organization in in the most powerful way. So when, when I see organizations that have, uh, five, you know, people from banks, which is typical on their boards. Right. And then they get another one. It's, it it bothers me because I think they are missing out on an opportunity to fill that seat with someone who's got maybe different centers of influence, different connections, a different perspective, different expertise. So anyway, so I think that goes back to, right. The diversity of that. And then I truly think it stops and starts. So after you figured out, yes, we're going to go and recruit that person. I, I think that you as an executive director maybe have one meeting, but there's got to be another board member at some point involved in that process because you've got the board. They're going to have to work with this person. It's going to be it's one governing body. So I I get very nervous when it's just the executive director driving a process like this. What What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I know, and only because sometimes the executive director isn't the best person to convince another board member, right? You no. need the you need that extra juice in the room, somebody that's kind of a peer that says, "Yes, this board's not awful. Um, they actually do things the way they're supposed to do it. It's a good organization." The, sometimes, you know, a third, uh, an executive director may not be the best person that's making that selling point. Well, and the other thing is, if you think about it, you're a potential board candidate, and if all you do is meet with the executive director, I think that sends a message right there about the organization and your fellow board members. Yep. And and really, then you think, oh, yeah, the master and uh, end all be all is the executive director. And, you know, that's just not accurate. And that's unhealthy to start like that. 
Nonprofit governance. Nonprofit answers. Nonprofit board. Nonprofit management. Nonprofit marketing. Nonprofit resources. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits presents Nonprofit Everything, the podcast about everything nonprofit, with your host, Andy Shurek and Stacy Wedding. So, Andy. <laughs> Do you think anyone even listens to our openings and closings? I think they have to because, because well, they could skip it. <laughs> There's like Please a skip don't button. skip us. No, totally skip it. No, don't do it. <laughs> if no. you skip it, you'll miss something important probably. Yeah. I, sometimes we actually throw in a couple of little like fun offers like, hey, if you tell us this word, we'll give you we did such that and once. such. Yeah. We did that once and we got, we got some people responding to it. We did. So, yeah. hey, so thank you to you those who listened to the beginning, <laughs> to the op- and opening and closing. So yeah. anyways, welcome to another episode of Nonprofit Everything, which is brought to you by the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits. We're very thankful to Anne for this. And we're thankful to you as our listeners for, for joining us, uh, for sharing your questions with us, and for, if you like this, sharing this with your friends and colleagues, because that's how we increase listenership and uh, all that good stuff. So appreciate you being here and uh, enjoy this episode. This episode of Nonprofit Everything is sponsored by the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits Job Board, your one-stop shop for the next step in your career. Searching job listings is totally free and AN members receive a big discount when posting new jobs. There are dozens of nonprofit jobs available right here in Nevada, and there are out-of-state jobs too. Find it by going to the Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits webpage and clicking the Job Board button or access it directly at jobs.alliancefornevadanonprofits.com or find the link in the Nonprofit Everything show notes. On a previous broadcast, you mentioned the IRS does not send determination letters anymore. Could you please revisit this statement with more detail? How else would a nonprofit document such status? <laughs> okay, so this is the most polite way I've ever read of someone saying, Andy, when you said something on the podcast, you're wrong. <laughs> and and so Bam. I'm calling you on it. So I, I didn't listen back to the question where I said this, which means that I'm taking plausible deniability on it. That I pro- you probably just misunderstood me. <laughs> yeah, it's all you. It's all you. And he's not no, going to take any it's ownership. It's more likely this. that I just didn't know what I was talking about or I was mumbling. But I don't think that was the specific question. I think we answered it. Anyway, um, so here's here's the actual answer. So, yes, the IRS does send determination letters. So if I, mis- I misspoke earlier, that's not the case. Um that, so when you originally do your Form 1023, so you send information to the IRS, you send them the big packet, you pay your 850 bucks or whatever it is. Um, they wait, they sit on it for a long time. They may ask you a bunch of irritating questions. Finally, you answer the irritating questions. You get back to them and they, they send you a letter, which is called a determination letter. And it starts the sentences, basically, congratulations, we have looked at your application and you are a tax exempt your, your organization is exempt from federal tax. And then it goes on and it tells you a whole bunch of technical details about it. It says, like, what is it 501c3? Like, is that, um, are you, which subsection yes. of that are you connected to? Because those are all important. Um, and most organizations don't realize how important they are. Um, what I was probably trying to say earlier mm-hmm. was um, in, and I think I looked it up and it was in 2008, the IRS eliminated um, what's called the advanced ruling. And those of us that have been in the nonprofit sector for a million years remember the advanced ruling. Oh, yes. So what that used to say is it would say, you, this is a temporary letter that you're going to get that says for the next five years, you can operate as a 501c3, blah, 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 nonprofit, right? So after five years, um, we will, you have to send us another piece of paper that has some other information on it. And at that point, we will send you your permanent determination letter. Right. And so what the IRS no longer does is they no longer send advanced ruling letters and they definitely don't send permanent determination letters. Um, what happens now is the and, and it says this on if you've gotten it since 2008, this is what it says. And some actually some organizations that were stuck in the middle that that got it in the period between 2003 and 2008 got stuck and couldn't get a permanent determination letter and only had the advanced ruling. Oh, yeah. And so I mean, bad yeah, time. Right. And you yeah. call the IRS and you'd ask them, they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. So, yeah. so there was impossible. So there are a bunch of, there's organizations that were formed in those five years. There's organizations that don't have a determination letter at all. They just have the advanced ruling letter. Um, what happens now is the current, you get the current letter that says, congratulations, you did it. Um, but 
then when you do your form 990 every year, other than the 990N, which is the East postcard, any other 990, there's now a section on it where you go through and you have to determine what your public support percentage is. And during the public support percentage, depending on how that gets filled out and it's averaged over a period of five years, then that can, that can shunt you into private foundation. You can, you know, it can move you to different places in it. Um, and so now you can use your initial determination letter, but the thing after five years, the thing that says whether or not you are legitimately a nonprofit is your most recent 990. And I, and I think probably what we were talking about <laughs> to defend myself again <laughs> is that, that there is no permanent determination right. letter anymore. Which you is, have to use the nine, like funders don't get it. They'll ask for your determination letter. They don't realize what they're getting is something that may have, may not apply anymore. Yeah. Um, and you can certainly send that because that talks about the first five years, but after those first five years, what they're really looking for is your most recent 990, but they can't read it and they don't know what they're looking for. No, they don't. And they, yeah, there's needs to be sort of a, a, a school for those giving money away about here's the things you or need to podcast. be looking for or a pot. Hey, we could do that. Yeah. <laughs> they could just listen to this one. Yeah. They could listen. Um, the other thing I'm wondering, and you may, you know this because um, I still thought there were advanced ruling periods. So I'm really glad you helped clarify that been, for me. It's only been 12 years. Oh, only, you know, I'm just a little behind, but, <laughs> but hey, most people would say that about me. So when you, I know that if you go to the IRS, right, everyone could go to the IRS and, and look up a charitable entity and see sort of, are they current? Are they, you know, has their status been revoked because maybe they didn't complete their 990s? Right. Do you know, does the IRS communicate with a letter to say, hey, your status has been revoked because you haven't done this in three years or whatever, sent, sent in your 990s or filed your 990s. I'm just curious, do you happen to know that? And if not, maybe we can do some research and put a link. Yeah, but. I actually don't know the answer to that. I know that there's there's a grace period. So if you don't fill out your 990 for a period of, I think it's three years, if you don't fill out a 990 for three years in a row, you get automatically revoked. Right. Um, they probably reach out. They probably send assume. a letter, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm not positive, but they've certainly never been in that position. <laughs> yeah. And nobody I worked with has ever been in that position. But they probably send a letter. Oh, my gosh. One organization I worked with, the, the 1023 had one address on it. And it took us six years to get them to change the address. Because they kept sending it to some random address from where the 1023 was. We'd moved since then. And every piece of IRS correspondence went with the wrong address. Oh. And we're like... Is there a change of address form? Is there, and we'd yes. call and they'd be like, yeah, fill out form, blah, blah, blah. And you do that and nothing would happen. And it was, it's, it's the most infuriating thing. But I do think, you know, they, they're probably mailing it to the wrong address. Yeah, they, I, <laughs> but I think that happens, something. right? Yeah. <laughs> what advantages and disadvantages does starting a B corporation have over starting a traditional nonprofit? Do you recommend B corporation structures to do-gooders? Okay, so full disclosure on this one. Number one, I did not write this question. <laughs> this is an actual question from a listener. This is not one that I faked in and seeded so that I can talk about B Corps. <laughs> well, and Andy is, I will say, Andy does have a B Corp. And so uh, even I, when I saw this question, sort of laughed like, and said, Seriously? oh, Andy, really? Are you priming the pump for you to talk about B Corps? We don't do that. That would be so, so this so, is <laughs> legitimate. I swear to God, this is an actual question. So, okay. And second of all, I'm so glad that you asked this. This is such a good thing. So back when I was at Three Square a million years ago, um, we had somebody come in um, who was talking to, I think, one of our food donors and was trying to get something from one of the food donors and said to the food donor, oh, we are a benefit corporation. And the food donor reached out to the food bank and said, what is this? Um, so, so I think it's important to clarify for nonprofits what a benefit corporation is, what it means and what, you know, how it affects you because because that's a really good really good question so that's kind of the, the lens that i'm going to use to answer okay it. so um what it is so that here's this is where it gets kind of confusing there are two things when you say benefit corporation there, that's one thing and when you say certified b corp that's something different hmm. so benefit corporation in 34 states in the u.s there is there's legislation that allows you to organize your corporation as something called a benefit corporation so it's a regular corporation. You set it up as a, just kind of like an S corp. Okay. You set it up just like a benefit, just and a nonprofit is usually a corporation too, right? Right. So you just set it up as a regular corporation, but then there's like an extra box you can check that says, I am, I also want to be a benefit corporation. And then you have to put a sentence in, in Nevada, at least you have to put a sentence in that says like, what's your purpose? And the purpose has to be something very specific, like we are going to do good things for people, <laughs> right? Okay. It has, it's actually, they don't want it to be super specific. It's actually, you know, let me know if you're 
thinking about it. So I can, I can walk you through the process if you want, but. Um, so, it, so let me stop you for a second. Yep. So it could basically be, so I'm starting, let's say I'm starting a new business and I check, yes, I want to be a benefit corporation. I could say I'm going to have volunteerism is going to be a huge part of our company culture, or we're going to have a corporate social responsibility program. Is that what you mean when you say sort of a broad statement? Yeah. And okay. it's like, so in the, in the state of Nevada actually has like a sentence that they want you to put in because oh. they don't want to really be vetting it. They don't want to be thinking about it the way the IRS thinks about it when you okay. do your form 1023 to be a nonprofit. Um, they, they just want you to like put the sentence in that says you understand what a benefit corporation is. So this is what a benefit corporation is. So in... 19, I don't know, like uh, Henry Ford built a whole bunch of housing for workers um, in Michigan. He had like, he put like built a whole community because he realized that his workers didn't need housing. He was then sued by his shareholders that said, that is not what you're supposed to be doing. Like you were supposed to be building cars and then the money you make from selling the cars, you're supposed to be using it to return to shareholders by making the stock price up, go up or paying out dividends. So the purpose of your business should not be to do fun, nice things for your workers. The purpose of your business should be generating money for shareholders, right? And this is something that you've heard over and over again, right? Like the, there's the whole Milton Friedman article from 1970 where he says the purpose of business is to make a profit, and that is it. Right. It shouldn't be doing anything else. Um, so, so what a benefit corporation is, it's just a legal flag that says, just so you know, anybody that's investing in this business, if you're a shareholder, if you're a stockholder, if you're putting investments in, if you're giving us a loan, anything you're doing, we're just making it known that we're not necessarily following that rule, that the purpose of our business is not necessarily to make profit. Of course, we want to make profit. Profit's fantastic. But that's not our 100% our purpose. And sometimes we may take some of the money that would typically be used for profit and use it for other things, like helping the environment. So, so 34, like I said, 34 states have language in their state laws that allow you to form a corporation as a benefit corporation, which basically lets you put on this legal flag that says we aren't necessarily, you know, for shareholders, just so you know, we're not necessarily going to, to be using our money to pay out our shareholders, right? And, and the, the, the enforcement mechanism is very, very weak. The enforcement okay. mechanism is if, if your board of directors doesn't feel like you're doing that if they feel like you're you're not following your rules as a b corp or, or as a as a benefit corporation see i even get confused on the language <laughs> yeah if if you're not if you're not doing that if you're really only focusing on profit and you're not doing anything else they can um they can call a meeting and have a conversation with you about it so there's really very little enforcement that goes on the state isn't interested in there's no outside third party Pretty much anybody can, like you said, anybody, as long as you check the box and you fill out the forms and you understand it, anybody can be a benefit corporation. And that's pretty much all it means is that you've just made that, you've just said that out loud. So other than the inherent goodness of being a benefit corporation, wh what are the advantages or what are the benefits for someone to be a benefit corporation? Um, are there that's specific? It. That's okay, it. that is, is it. So the benefit corporation, if you're going to set up as a benefit corporation, the only the only positive thing of being a benefit corporation is that it's, it makes it more uncomfortable for shareholders to sue you for not paying out all of your profits as shareholders okay. dividends and things. That's it. So that's what a benefit corporation is. The second piece of it is what we call a certified B Corp. So, okay, so let me say this. In Nevada, there are hundreds of benefit corporations. Hundreds of people have checked that box. Do they know what it meant when they checked it? Maybe not. Do they um, intend to behave that way? Probably not. Do they think that it gives them some sort of um, additional benefit yeah. beyond a regular corporation? Perhaps. Um, I would suggest that since it's so easy to check the box and enter one sentence, it doesn't cost any more to be a benefit corporation. People just do it because they think it sounds cool. Like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm Ooh, cool. I'm a benefit Yeah, I'm a nice guy. Yeah. I want to check the box. And, and honestly, that's this, okay, 100% my opinion, right? I've talked to a couple of people who are benefit corporations and didn't even realize the box was checked. Okay. Like, you know, because I'm, so I'm talking to them, I'm, you know, did you know you're a benefit corporation? I am? What's that? <laughs> Okay, so you didn't that really. That says it all. Right? So, and that's, I mean, again, opinion based on a sample size of like five. Right, right. <laughs> of the hundreds and hundreds in Nevada that have checked the box. And okay, so, and there are 34 states in the U.S. that do that, plus there are other laws in other countries that allow it to. The next piece is, the other thing that gets people confused is there's this thing called certified B Corp. And it's just the letter B. And you've seen this logo everywhere. It's a B with a circle around it. Um, so... New Belgian Brewing Company, who makes Fat Tire, King Arthur Flour, Patagonia, Kickstarter, Etsy, Dannon, Method Soap, 
um, Burt's Bees, um, Dr. Bronner's Soap, like lots of these brands that you've, you've and I've, you know, they're, they're 2,500, I think, 2,500 oh. certified B Corps in the U.S. Or no, in the world, 2,500. Most of them are in the U.S. Um, of these, these companies that are certified B Corps. Um, and what that is, is that's sort of another level beyond the, the benefit corporation checkbox. So the benefit corporation checkbox isn't actually required to be a certified B Corp. What that is, is that you take a, uh, uh, an assessment called the B Impact Assessment. It's available online, totally free. Or the link in the show notes if you're interested in taking a look at it. Um, what that is, is a questionnaire that asks you a whole bunch of questions about how you treat your customers, how you treat the environment, how you treat your community, um, and what your governance structure is set up like. Um, and then it asks a whole bunch of additional qualifying questions like, you know, is your, are you in the private prison industry? Like, you know, <laughs> okay. things that are not necessarily, th- they don't disqualify you, but they, it's sort of a red flag a red that flag, maybe yeah. you're not serious about this. So, so it's an assessment. You take it, and if you can get over, right now, it's if you can get over 80 points, um, you can be certified as a certified B Corp, and then you can use that logo. You can use the B with a circle around it, put it on all your stuff, um, and it tells people that you have you have passed the pretty relatively high bar of all of these things that you're doing. Not just, and it's not just philanthropy. It's not just what you're doing in the community. It's, and it's not just the environment either, because that's the other sort of people just assume it's a, it's a sustainability thing, mm-hmm. but it really is about how your governance is set up. It's how you treat your employees, how you treat your customers. So is it a rigorous, is that assessment just you saying, you know, checking all the boxes or how much do you have to prove that you're actually doing that. So you can take that. So if you want those, if you want the logo and you want to be, you want to actually use it, um, you actually have to have, you have to be audited. So they will, you check the box and then they, someone will come out, they'll either come out to you or they'll do it on the phone and they'll like walk you through, like you have to prove it. Like, for example, you know, do you have a stakeholder plan? It's like, so you can say, you can check the box. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then they're going to come back and say, okay, show me the stakeholder plan. And they'll look at it and they go like, and eh, it's not really a stakeholder plan. So you don't really go those points. So of the so to kind of get a sense of how difficult it is, so the the B impact assessment is free for anybody to take. And you don't have to verify your answers to take it, right? You just take it, right. you get the score at the end of it. The average score of all the people that have ever taken it is in the low fifties. It's like okay. fifty one, fifty three, something around that there. Um, in order to be say you're a certified B Corp, you have to score at least eighty. Oh. So you have to get eighty or higher to be a certified B Corp. Um, there's a possible two hundred points. I think the highest I've ever seen is like hundred and thirty. So it's it's very very difficult to score really really high. Um, the it's really about proving about keeping you know making sure that you understand how it works and then proving that you you are really behaving that way. You know everybody can say and, the, and part of the reason is but everybody can say they're a good company. Of course. Like everybody wants you know they'll give you their their annual CSR report that talks about all the fantastic that it's stuff more that of a they're PR doing. piece than right. an actual Which, you know yeah. and PR is fantastic but if you're not really doing it or if you know the PR department says it's one way but the legal department is behaving a completely different way like you, one of the things that certified B corporations have certified B corps have is that they're actually they have to have to prove it they all have to be moving the same direction or else you don't get the point is that an ongoing so you have to prove it at the beginning um, it sounds like as, as part of that, or if you want to use the logo or maybe not at the beginning, but whenever you decide, I want to use the certified B Corp logo, you, ha- you go through that audit process. Is Do they do that regularly? Like, yep. is that so? Yeah. So you, you, one of the, one of the things that you have to do as a certified B Corp is you have to prove it, right? And so the, you need some mechanism to, like, basically you take the assessment every year, you post your score okay. every year. Um, and then every other year to recertify, you have to go through the process and they'll audit you again. Um, and then I think 10% of people, they actually fly someone out to sit with you and walk through stuff together. So you don't just do it on the phone. They actually physically come to your location and check stuff out. So you're like, you can't like lie about, yeah, I totally recycle batteries the right way. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> They'll be like, okay, show me how you're recycling the batteries. I'm like, uh. <laughs> right? So, so Yeah. So, so, so you, it is this sort of rigorous thing. But to answer, to back to answer the question. Yes. So like, when would I, you know, as, and again, Full total disclosure. Like Valor CSR, my company is a certified B Corp. I'm one of three certified B Corps in the state of Nevada, the only one in Southern Nevada. And 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 if somebody talks to me, people ask me about that all the time. And what I recommend is if if you think that you are interested in this kind of thing, read up on it. And the B Impact Assessment is totally free. You can take the B Impact Assessment totally free. Um, to as for the decision between which is a better structure for a business that wants to do good is a 
is a B corporation or a nonprofit, which structure is better, I think is, an, is a very complicated business plan conversation. And we've said this a hundred times, like the only reason you would ever want to be a nonprofit is because your business plan is based on people giving you money and getting nothing in return except for goodwill. Exactly. The good feeling of giving to some good cause. So if you have a company that you think you want to sell stuff and you, you just want to, you just want to be a great company and you want to do like Patagonia. I mean, Patagonia right. sells a lot of stuff, but they also spend an awful lot of money like protecting wildlife and protecting wild lands and keeping, you know, they're super serious about sustainability and climate change. Um, there's an open question about whether or not, you know, like who's, who's better for the overall environment. Is it the Sierra Club or is it Patagonia? So these are two people that are working in a very similar space, but they're going with going about it with two totally different business models. So the Sierra Club thinks that the most important way that they can raise money is to just ask people for it. Say, this is important. I would like you to give me some money so I can take care of it. You've got Patagonia that's like, check out this cool jacket. Right, right. <laughs> right? Totally Buy this different. jacket and we'll give a ton of money to it, right? Totally so, different. you know, it's not as much. It's not, you know, 100% of your Patagonia jacket purchase does not go to saving wildlife somewhere, yeah. um, but a portion of it does. So, so it's a, just a completely different business model. And so thinking about that big picture business model of like, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to, do you want to sell junk or do you want to, do you want to engage with people about what, what, what good things you're doing in the community? Do you think donations are the way to go? I think that's a, that's a very complicated decision that's, that has to be decided individually one project at a time. Well, and I also wonder for people who, are just starting out or have a, a really cool concept or idea. I think many don't know about some of these other options available and think that, oh, I need to set up a nonprofit. And everyone listening to this probably rolls their eyes and goes, no, not yep. one more nonprofit, yep. right? And especially I really get into conversations with people and say, are you okay having a board of directors? You're the founder, you created this nonprofit, but you have a board of directors at any point could fire you, could, you know, has really is governing this organization and, and you are facilitating that. But, but at the end of the day, they have the power and a lot of people don't want to give that up. And so this might be another option um, depending on how they're structured. Right. I mean, some still, you know, B Corps still have, you know, certified B Corp may still have a board, but I'm just sitting there thinking, you know, I look at a company like mine, right? Not a certified B Corp set up as an S Corp. And I'm, I'm thinking, and I don't have what my governance structure is me and (laughs) my husband or something. Right. right? So I'm like, okay, great. I still get to keep the control of making decisions. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I get I get this added, you know, thing that I can, it's a conversation starter. And it's, I think when you look at all the trends out there, and I'm sure Andy, you could speak more to this than even I can, but you look at all the trends and every people are starting to do business with people who have something like in their fiber, in the fabric of their organization that says we are committed to doing good, whether that's helping the environment, whether that's, you know, a CSR program. So Mm -hmm. this feels like one conversation starter for people looking to do business with you know, socially responsible companies. Yeah. And I, I think in different markets, it's, it, it's different. So in, in Boulder, Colorado and Burlington, Vermont, like so you can't, you can't walk without tripping over a B Corp. Um, here in Southern Nevada, this is, it's something that's kind of brand new. And so I don't think it's, we're not quite getting that same amount of like, just like organic engagement. If yeah. people are that are looking for this kind of company, but you're right. It's like when employees, employees want to work for yes. companies. I mean, they say it all the time. They want to work for the same reason that people work for nonprofits. Right. They want to work for somebody that's actually doing something. They want to work for somebody that's doing something good. And B Corps give you some of that. I mean, not all of it. And, and nothing makes me more angry than a company that like B Corp or not, a company that walks into a space that's being currently occupied by a nonprofit and being done really, really well by a nonprofit and then trying to take some of the credit for all of the fantastic things that nonprofits are doing. Um, they should be they should be supporting those nonprofits 100 percent and not trying to steal their fire because and they're you know they're, I won't name names but there are people that I come across locally yes. that are in a specific space that is that is currently being occupied by a nonprofit and they're talking they're talking about getting sponsorship you know they use the word sponsorship when they're talking about how they work with other organizations and it's just not kosher it's just like it's it's either either own it and be a nonprofit 100 percent or 
or get out of the way and let the people that need to do the work do the work. And don't try to be halfway. And I don't, you know, B Corps, B Corps are not halfway. B Corps are, are regular old companies that have just made a commitment to not be horrible. Yeah. Right. And so like, and we're going to prove that we're not, we're not a horrible company. And we're, you know, in my case, like, because I'm talking to people about CSR, like literally, if, if I'm not a B Corp, I'm full of it. Yes. Right? Because if I'm not, if I don't believe this, like if you're coming to me to help you figure out your corporate social responsibility activities. Like if you, if I don't believe it enough to be a certified B Corp, then why on earth would you ask me those questions? <laughs> exactly. Right. So. Well, and from a disadvantage standpoint, one final question is, so the only disadvantage I'm hearing from at least the certified B Corp is the time, energy, effort of the audit. I think that's part of it, but you also lose access to all of the normal things that nonprofits get to do, which is access to grant, access to foundations, right, right. access to donors. You can't do direct mail. Like you still have to have a product. You still, you still have to have a good business idea that sells stuff. And that's, you know, we talk about this all the time is like, you know, I've got, or at least we hear from people that talk about these kinds of things. It's like, I've got this, this idea for a business, but it kind of sucks. So should I make it a nonprofit, oh, right? Yeah, because that's somehow <laughs> magically going to have right? money fall from heaven. Yeah, yeah. so it's, so it's yeah. still a business. I mean, you yeah. still have to have, there still has to be something that generates cash. You have to have the business model make sense in order to do it. And it's just that sometimes if it falls on the donors will drive us side, nonprofits are going to be way better at that. If it falls on the you know, maybe we can sell a bunch of profit. You know, it's Pat Patagonia. Like that couldn't ever be a nonprofit, but they do a lot of good work. So, so I think it's the, it's the difference in the difference in structure, I think is the big question. That's the disadvantage is that you just, you're not the other thing. Right. Not, right. Know. Hey, Stacy, you know what? What? I'm really, really tired of people asking us. Oh, well, yikes. People well, that's a bad asking thing. Us questions. And you know what? So I'm, this is my turn. Now I'm going to ask oh. a question. Oh, Are you're ready? so intense, Andy. <laughs> you're scaring turn. me a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question of our nonprofit everything listeners. What do you want us to talk about? What kinds of things are you interested in hearing? When you listen, because this is the end of the podcast. Congratulations. You made it to the end of another episode. What were you wondering that we would talk about? Or as you're listening to it, you thought, you know what? I'd like to hear something about let us know what that is. That's my question to you. Come up with something. Send it to us somehow. Facebook, Twitter, the Nonprofit Everything webpage. Um, bug Stacy at home, especially at no. night. No. Fix that. Text her at three in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're going to, that's what kind of response you're going to get. The Alliance for Nevada Nonprofits webpage. Um, all of those places are good ways to get in contact with us. And, and the questions that you, again, the questions that you send us are the only reason this works. If you don't send us questions, we'll start making them up and they're going to be really stupid. Yeah, so we boring. Like <laughs> they're going to be really highly technical accounting questions Oof. and really complicated board scenarios. Oof. So you don't want us to do either of those two things. So, so send us your questions. And again, thanks, Anne, for making this possible. We appreciate you. Mm -hmm.